and to Marvin for that previous session. Uh, we're going to hear now a speech. It's a recorded speech from uh, Pat McFadden MP, who's the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Um, unfortunately, as happens to MPs, he's been called away to Parliament this afternoon to debate the fiscal statement. Uh, but he has sent a video recording for us after his uh, speech. Uh, Charlotte will be back here along with Ben Franklin, the Director of Research and policy for the CPP, who we also heard from earlier. They'll be on the stage to give us some analysis on what Mr. McFadden says in his speech. So let's listen to that, and we'll be back with you shortly. I'm very pleased to be able to join you by video today to give you some thoughts on economic growth from a Labour perspective. I had talked to, to be with you in person, but politics moves fast these days. And we have a two-day debate here in Parliament on last week's autumn statement. I'm closing that debate for the opposition tonight. And parliamentary convention dictates that I have to be there throughout the debate. So I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. However, the autumn statement and the events leading up to it over a long period of time are a good place to start a speech considering economic growth. It's a critical subject for us because only through sustained economic growth will we make the country more prosperous and our citizens better off. And without that, we are locked in a doom loop of tax rises, stagnating incomes and appeals to the British public to tighten their belts. So let me begin by outlining the UK's position in the short term and then crucially over the longer term. In the short term, of course, we've had the experience of the Trust Quartang mini budget, a series of permanent tax cuts funded through borrowing with the wealthiest benefiting the most. Some called it Reaganism without the dollar. Or you could say the government was proposing to borrow from my constituents in Wolverhampton to fund tax cuts for people earning over £150,000 a year. The intention was to unleash the animal spirits to give us a new incarnation of the very old theory of trickle-down economics. And it was all done with disdain for the institutions that safeguard our economic credibility in the Treasury, uh, where the Permanent Secretary was fired, the OBR, and the Bank of England. And remember, we were told by the Chancellor at the time that this was just the beginning, that there was more to come, even though he was later to claim that he thought it was all uh, too much too soon. We saw what happened, a run on the pound, Emergency interventions from the Bank of England to prop up the pension system, rocketing mortgage rates. All the theories in all those pamphlets which ran up to this statement over many years were taken into a corner and given a punishment beating by the financial markets, by the harsh realities of borrowing costs, rises in mortgage rates, and those crucial intangibles of trust and confidence. It was a real-time experiment in going for a sugar rush approach to growth. And the first thing that I want to make clear to you today is that having been through that right-wing sugar rush experiment, Labour is not going to propose a mirror image of the same thing. But that's only the short term. What about the longer term? We can't understand the UK's current economic position if we think it all comes down to a few weeks of using the country as the test bed for an ideological experiment. This is about 12 years, not 12 weeks. For the past 12 years, we have had anemic economic growth. UK economic growth has been well below the OECD average. Now to give you an idea of what this means, Grown at the OECD average, each household in the country would be £10,000 a year better off today. £10,000 a year. Think of the resilience that that would give UK households when faced with external shocks 
like the energy price rise that we're going through now. The UK is the only G7 country where the economy is still smaller than before the pandemic. And the OBR estimated last week that it will be a further two years before that position is recovered. And comparing us to other developed countries and looking to the future, the UK is forecast to have the lowest growth in the OECD over the next two years. So the autumn statement and the weak economic outlook that lay behind it isn't just a product of the mini budget. Its roots go a lot deeper and they reflect a United Kingdom where incomes relative to our neighbours have been falling behind. The external shocks that have hit us are big and they're real and are not denied by anyone. Both the pandemic and Putin's invasion of Ukraine have been very costly for many countries. But the UK has been left more exposed to these shocks because of its underlying economic performance over a long period of time. The question then is how to change this picture and secure the economic growth that the country needs. As I said, we don't believe this can be done through a short-term dash for growth. This isn't like flicking on or off a light switch. It's going to take a long-term plan, policy consistency and a determined and focused drive to see it through. So what might some elements of that plan be? Today, I briefly want to mention five important things in a long-term plan for growth. Firstly, the country has to be a good place to start and grow a business. There's fantastic creativity and innovation in the UK, but ideas that are born here often end up being developed elsewhere. And we also have competitors who want the same things as us. That's why we have commissioned Lord Jim O'Neill to lead a review of startups to see what changes might be needed to make the most of British innovation. And this is all part of a broader partnership approach with business, which Keir Starmer is setting out to the CBI conference today. Secondly, workforce. You can't have good growth without a highly skilled workforce. Almost every business that we speak to talks about staff shortages and skill shortages. This is modern supply side economics. How do we ensure that we have workers who can do the jobs of today and tomorrow? My colleague, Jonathan Ashworth, has spoken of targeted help to get some of the hundreds of thousands of people who've left the workforce post COVID back into work. It's why we've placed such a stress on mental health support with a promise to ensure that everyone who needs it can have a consultation within a month. And it's why we want to see reform of the apprenticeship levy to make it more flexible to suit the real training needs in the economy. Thirdly, let's make opportunities of the challenges facing us and nowhere is the need for this more true than the need for energy security and the transition to cleaner and greener power. For Labour, this will be a national mission. Through our Green Prosperity Plan, which will insulate our drafty homes, triple solar power, double onshore wind, invest in new nuclear, green hydrogen and more. And through this plan, our ambition is to make sure that Britain is a world leader in the change that we know is coming. We will combine the power of government with the excellence of our universities, the skill of our manufacturers, and ensure that we've got the workforce to do the jobs. Fourthly, we can't see growth as a purely internal matter. We have to be able to trade better with the rest of the world and deal with some of the consequences of Boris Johnson's Brexit deal. We will not rerun the Brexit argument, but we do want to fix some of the gaps in that deal, whether that's through a veterinary agreement to reduce costs and bureaucracy for our food and drinks industries, to mutual recognition of professional qualifications, to a negotiated settlement on the issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol. A Labour government will want a positive adult relationship with our fellow democracies 
in Europe. We will not see or portray them as the enemy. We have changed our economic relationship with them, but they are our allies, and that will be the spirit of the approach that we take. And finally, as this conference rightly says, we need to make sure that every part of the country feels the benefits of growth. That's why we talk about inclusive growth, and it's the right theme. If the headline figure of GDP rises, but people don't benefit, why would they see that as an advantage? Growth must be inclusive, both geographically and across income groups. That way prosperity rises and the standard of living improves. That way also we stop politics from being an arena simply for culture wars. We limit the space for demagogues and we focus public service on the task it should be focused on, improving the opportunities and lives of the population. The experience of recent months should have taught us all about the importance of financial stability. To have Britain singled out as a case study in economic mismanagement should be a lesson for a long time to come. Reckless irresponsibility has cost the country dearly, both in pounds and in reputation, and the public has now been asked to pay the price. But if we are to forge a better future, we can't see financial stability as an end in itself. If that's the beginning and the end of our ambition, then all we'll be doing is managing decline. So for Labour, financial stability is essential, but it's also a platform upon which we want to build a long-term plan for growth. And only if we do that can we make the country more prosperous and our citizens better off. Only if we do that do we generate the wealth necessary to fund our public services, reduce the NHS waiting times, equip our children from the, for the future, care for our people and have the strong defence forces that the country needs. We want to combine strong wealth creation with good public services and we believe those two things go hand in hand. In short, for us, financial stability has to be a platform for hope, and that's exactly what we intend. Pat McFadden, Chief Secretary, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. So, Charlotte Aldrett and Ben Franklin from the CPP, a reminder, a non-partisan organisation, we're uh, going to share their thoughts with you now, and then we'll take a few questions from you very soon. Charlotte and Ben. So in, in Pat's absence, I'm afraid you're seeing a little bit more of me than, uh, than previously billed, but um, I, uh, hopefully Ben and I can shed a little bit of light on, on our thoughts as a kind of institutional response to what we've just heard and maybe some reflections on the conversation this morning before we then go into our star billing of uh, Marina Hyde uh, afterwards. Um, ben, what did you think? Um, well, my first thoughts are he needs a Labour banner in the video. Um, <laughs> it was quite, it was quite barren and stark <laughs> and austere. But he can't fair, compete fair with play. our branding. Fair, exactly right, exactly right. Um, but in, in terms of his sort of um, definition of the problem, I thought a lot of it was was what we would probably agree with. You know, I think there's a very important point in all of this that. It, our current economic malaise is not just about Brexit. Not, people love to talk about Brexit, and there are two sides of the coin on that, on the right and the left. Um, but you know, our long-term, long-run productivity problems do stem much further back than, than, the, than the Brexit vote. And the legacy of austerity did and has led to worse health, lower investment in skills and education, the sorts of things we believe in as an organization can help to turn the tide of um, of low growth rates. Um, it, you didn't mention persistently high inequality. I think that's a really important part of the picture. And it's that high levels of inequality that have also helped to drag back um, our, our economy. Um, now, I, I think there's, there's something about what could have been done differently 
in 2010 to 2020, but you know we, we are where we are. Um, in terms of the solutions, I think it, it is a good thing to set out the point that you need a long-term plan um, and some level of policy consistency. We've been all over the shop recently and basically just not fucking up. It's actually a really important <laughs> thing, if I can say that in the Royal Institution. Rubbing um, up, but we've done it now. You know, avoid self-driven mistakes, your own economic shocks. You know, don't, don't do that. Um, there's obviously a, a lot around green growth and investment. I think there's something to be done in terms of where those green investments should take place and how they link in with the levelling up agenda, which I, I'd like to hear more about. Um, Labour obviously show, showing that they, they want to be seen as the party of business. There's a big question about how we do that. How do we create more business investment in the UK? That is a very big question right now, which I don't think anyone's fully cracked. Um, I know there's also separately Labour's um, industrial strategy that they've come out with, which harks back to some of the things Theresa May was talking about. So some consistency around that framework, I think, um, will be will be interesting and, and good. Obviously, there's lots to be worked out here. How do you um, deliver better public services in the current fiscal environment? We had a bit of that debate earlier on. How do we fund um, a green revolution. Uh, how do we utilise places and the assets of places? And we've done a fair bit of work, obviously, at CPP around that. And you've heard some of some of that already. We did a really good report, if I can do a plug, uh, called A Gear Change for Growth, which talked about assets even in low productivity areas and particularly um, high productivity industries that could be utilised. Um, and then the big question of, of how is, you know, do we need a debate on what, how do we get those public services that, that we want, you know, that, I mean, there was uh, interesting polling done um, last year, which suggests the public are, are more happier with higher taxes. How persistently that view is held is obviously um, to be to be seen. Um, and there's a critical thing as well in all of this around better targeting of resources. And I think local government is a very good example of this and linking that to the levelling up agenda. So, you know, council taxes are generally a regressive tax. Levelling up money was done through a funding formula that was a bit political, to say the least. There's uncertainty around the Shared Prosperity Fund, and that's also allocated using an old formula. So there's lots of ways, even with existing money, that we can be more efficient too. Um, and then there's moving on to skills funding and apprenticeships. You know, how do we get more schools, schools and skills funding into the areas that need them? Um, we did some work recently looking at apprenticeship participation and it's falling in the most deprived areas. So a lot of this is about the how. You know, I think we'd sign up to a fair amount of the vision. The question is how we actually get there. And I think also the centre right would sign up to a lot of that vision as well. And so my initial observations. Mm, great. Um, I'm going to say that I thought the best bit was the end, and I don't mean that pejoratively. I think he ended on the idea of hope. And I think coming back to what I was saying earlier about the need to be optimistic, I think now is the time where if Labour are going to win the next election, they have to be the future. And I think they can, you know, trust, and that whole debacle kind of gifted them their, their poll lead. And they're going to try and cling on to that. Rishi's narrowing, as, narrowing the gap, as we heard Ben Page talk about this morning. Um, but I think if Labour can paint themselves as not only that, that kind of credible, almost kind of technocratic in his delivery, these are the things that we need to go through, economic stability as a platform for growth. I think if they can really imbue that with a sense of hope, I mean, I think that is going to be the election winning combination. I think at the moment, um, Jeremy Hunt, we heard in the autumn statement last week, is uh, is kind of paving the way for this Osborne X shifting of the narrative to the kind of fiscal black hole. You can't trust Labour on tax and spend, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of trying to set out the parameters for the, for the election. I think if Labour can really hold on to a sense that their vision is a more hopeful one, I think that's potentially their, their ticket. Um, I am pleased to hear that principle number five, and maybe I'll put it to number one, was actually inclusive growth, you know, what we stand for. Um, and, and Ben set out some of the ways that, um, you know, the Labour agenda aligns with ours. I think more of an emphasis on place, I think, mm. would be beneficial to them. And Labour hasn't really, despite um, having more um, mayors than the Conservatives by a country mile, actually mm. hasn't really cashed in on that 
um, electoral track record or the kind of delivery track record that, that comes with that. Um, and we can speculate on, on the reasons why that might be the case. But I think, um, again, coming back to some of the polling that we were doing with Ipsos, I think if people are genuinely, you know, concerned for their, the future of their place in ways that they haven't been typically before, I think drilling down to that local leadership level, I think will also be part of that package for hope that um, uh, Pat McFadden set out. Um, yeah, some, some, some initial thoughts there, but I guess if, Martine, did you want to take questions from the audience yes, and then you can field them to us? Yes, the, the mic we have, the microphones are in the wings again. That's the first hand that went up. Right, let me try and be really clever about this. So we've got a hand there, a hand there, a hand there, and one there. Right, that's four to start with. That should be quite an efficient use of the microphone as well. It'd be nice to have some women. Yeah, um, hopefully I'm audible. Uh, I'm a student from King's College London. But what seems to be the overarching theme is that it's good to hear, but we'd like more details, isn't it? And that seems to be the overarching trend about labor, that they have a vision, but it's not extremely sellable. Especially with the polling that we talked about Ipsos Mori, is that he's not likable. The vision is understood, but it's not a vision. It's more like, a, eh, we understand. Especially with regards to Brexit. Is this, is this a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm asking, <laughs> so is there a problem of, you know, uh, either it could be a convincing vision or is it like the dog that catches the bus at the end of it? Like it does at the end of it, but they don't know what they're doing, especially with Brexit. So that's my question. I'm not sure. Do, what do they know what? Do they really know what they're it, doing? Is it's, that what you're... it's either they they have a vision that's perfectly articulated, or they have a problem of they do get elected, but they are they don't have clarity, and it's like the dog that ca catches the bus. I don't understand that dog that catches the bus. <laughs> so a, a dog chases the bus completely, but once it gets there, it doesn't it's know what's going It's <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Without the lack of I'm vision. Are you calling for more transport infrastructure so... to beat the dog? <laughs> I'm sorry. So are you saying Labour will? Get Labour will catch the bus and hop on it and then think, don't know where we're going. Yeah, exa okay, exactly. We got there. Okay. Non-partisan organisation. Yeah. Non-partisan. Yeah. Should we take a seat and come back to the dog? We'll, we'll come back to the dog. We'll have a, let's mull that over. The gentleman here. Oh, hey, where's the, where's the, where's it going? Have we got some women as well? Oh yes, look, hands gone up. Um, sorry, sorry chaps. I'm showing my bias on time. Hi, my name's Eva Rutehouse. I'm Chief Officer for Culture and Economy at Leeds City Council. Leeds. Leeds. <laughs> Leeds. Leeds Uni. Um, we haven't... Um, happy, happy to welcome you back anytime. Um, we haven't um, heard anything uh, from anyone today about how we measure inclusive growth. Um, I would really like to hear from Labour and Conservatives and anyone, any politician, how they actually intend to, to measure, measure their progress in levelling up delivering inclusive How growth. How do you measure inclusive, okay. inclusion, inclusivity? Do you know? Yeah. We can certainly can give some answers on that one. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Tell us then. Yeah. So uh, you obviously haven't read our 2018-2019 body of work on this. <laughs> um, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, we did a whole series of, of reports on how you measure it. Uh, well, good growth. So, okay, so there's inclusive growth is a bit of a process as well as an outcome, but we were trying to measure good growth um, and we looked at four or five specific indicators. Mm. So one of which is health, which is a really important one. Um, another one is around inequality, um, productivity, and leisure as well, actually, we measured, because we think people shouldn't just be working nine to five. But that was a very simplistic and reductive way of doing it. Obviously, local areas will measure it in their own ways, and there's no one right or wrong way. It's what works best for you. Um, but I would, I would obviously plug that body of work. But there are lots of other things that we want to be measuring as well to understand how they link in with that. So obviously, we're going through a cost of living crisis at the moment, which is going to underpin and undermine a lot of uh, the inclusive growth challenges that, that places and countries are facing. And so we've done some measurement work around this as well to try and identify which areas are most at risk. So just some basically some plugs for our work right there. And we can happy to send out links at the end of this conference. There as well. you go. Plenty of resources available to you. And Leeds. Give my love to Leeds. Uh, gentleman here. My name is Paul Hudson. I retired. I've um, spent my life in uh, finance, trade, commerce, administration, and just over half of it in academia in Australia and in Britain and in Germany. 
Um, I don't know whether um, uh, Charlotte has been listening to the same talks I have. I couldn't see on the basis of the evidence provided what there was for optimism. The other thing that I find is misleading, particularly for an economy, is it going more and more into the services sector? Uh, it it take, makes any sense to talk about productivity. On the question of making our politics more credible, somebody who's been a casual observer of central uh, government politics and local government, uh, particularly planning committees, I think a major problem is that a lot of the candidates standing in the local and parliamentary elections don't have any particular skills or talents to offer. Okay, that can seems I, to be Paul, different to what turn, you find Paul, in Germany. Can we turn it into a question? What, yes. where is, it says the question, where yeah. is the optimism? Why should we opti be optimistic? Yes, and, yes? and what about okay. the idea of increasing the, uh, the, the qualifications? I'm going to just take class. one. I'm going to just okay. take one. I've got too many people. Um, the two hands there, gentlemen there, gentlemen there, and then a, a lady there. I hope you don't mind me calling you gentlemen ladies. It seems appropriate in this environment. Um, have, you got the, have you got the microphone? Both of you there, please. And then, I don't know how long we've got. We've got five more minutes, it'll be all right. I had a question on the shape of the growth function in relation to climate change. Um, there is concerning evidence that a sort of linear, unlimited model of growth may not be compatible with pursuing the 1.5 degrees goal. Do you reckon that we should explore new models of growth, including circular models of economies uh, or sort of the donut, uh, you know, the donut structure, that kind of stuff? Because there's not been much talk about a growth, for instance, and that kind of debates. What do you think okay. on that? Do we need a new model of growth? And then we need to go back to the why, why, why are we optimistic? New model of growth. Do we need one? And yeah, like, yeah, sorry, go on, go ahead. I was just going to say, in terms of the, you know, are, is climate change and growth compatible with what I think? I think you can achieve growth sustainably, and I think actually setting out a green growth agenda, which in, it means investing in some of the stuff that Pat was talking about, is a way forward. And I think we have we have successfully decreased emissions, and certain cities, including London, have increasingly decreased emissions while growing at the same time. I'm not sure I sign up for the circular economy. Vision doesn't mean that others won't and some local areas do. I just, I'm not sure I really conceptually understand where it's going. Um, there was a question about optimism and services and productivity. You know, I, you know, I can share some of the, what, the concerns around that, obviously, and we spoke a lot about that this morning. But you also have to say, given how quickly growth and productivity fell during austerity, actually just a bit more public investment may well help to raise our, raise our growth rate. So I'm a bit more optimistic about, about what might happen there. Also, not all places are just service orientated. There are still pockets of manufacturing and other industries as well uh, that places could harness. Be my responses. Yeah, I mean, I'd say um, I wouldn't be in this game of public policy if I weren't optimistic that we could fix the problems. And I think we can define them to the cows come home and typically that's usually where public policy research kind of stops. And one of the things I really pride myself on at, at CPP is that we want to go that extra mile and, and we really want to think creatively about how we push on. Um, so, and I, I think it's the role of our politicians and leaders to, to be part of that as well. Um, in terms of vision but not detailed, I think we're at part of the electoral cycle where Labour will increasingly need to be more detailed about how it plans to deliver. Um, I think at the moment it's trying to avoid being um, interviewed as if it were the government. Um, and I think they will want to kind of keep their powder dry and will want to have time to develop policy as it pertains to the context, which is so dynamic at the moment. Um, so I expect to see more, otherwise they won't win. So the dog needs to know where he's going <laughs> as he gets on the bus. Well played. I hope we've brought that to its conclusion. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> I understand that the specific way the UK is trying to tackle the a very unique, um, very idiosyncratic, shall I say, um, problem of regional inequality, economic inequality, um, above all, is political dev uh, devolution of governments. Um, one thing that I have concerns about is how would cities or regions going to sell the idea of 
of, of private financing and private investment in this region. Because as we talked about uh, previously, the UK has a very resilient credibility as, a, as, um, uh, as, as an opportunity for investment. But I cannot see that for specific regions outside Greater London, Greater Manchester, What's, maybe Birmingham. Can, and, can you and encapsulate Denver. it as a question just quickly, please? Yes, how, how should regions, especially those most economically deprived in the UK, uh, cater to the global uh, private investor? Um, I just, I mean, obviously Marvin came out with some really good points in the last session exactly on that. It's, it's about having some forms of consistent funding streams so you can plan over the long term and you can think about how you can crowd in investment. I think he made that case brilliantly and that's, that's Bristol, that's not, that's not southeastern London. Obviously Bristol has its own dynamism, but so do parts of the northeast, northwest as well. If you want to take Final question, please, if I may. The lady with the microphone. Is it on? <clears throat> Don't worry, I'm the now? same problem. Oh, um, just picking up on the sentiments around optimism um, and certainly what the public does or doesn't feel in the UK um, and the question over there about sort of the compatibility of the growth sort of narrative with sustainability. Um, and I suppose there's a bit of a challenge right at the end of this conference of what a next conference theme might look like. Is it... Is, are we talking about sort of living rather than growth and how can we have inclusive living as opposed to inclusive growth? Um, just sort of a, a sort of a broad and slightly existential question, perhaps. So, so, so can you t turn it into a question for us so we can answer it? What, what is the next step after achieving sort of everything that's been talked about today um, is Crikey. the narrative around <laughs> inclusive living. Um, that is ambitious. Yes. What's the next step? Maintain it. Yeah, maybe I'm not so optimistic. I think we've got a lot of work to do to get there. But I just want to, I guess, end on this. First of all, in my opening remarks this morning, I said that CPP is about clean, inclusive growth and understanding that the planet and our environmental, you know, natural capital, environmental limits are complete hygiene factor, really, when we're thinking about growth. If it's going to be socially sustainable, if it's going to be environmentally sustainable, we need to think about that. But to give me a credible answer on how we solve poverty or inequality without growth, I haven't seen one yet. And we're starting to see with the pinch of the cost of living crisis what a world looks like when we don't have growth. So I will defend growth to the hill. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we haven't got through more of them. Um, it's great to have so many questions. Sometimes we struggle for things like that, don't we, at conferences? Charlotte, uh, Ben, for the moment, thank you very much for <laughs> responding to Pat McFadden. Thank you.